everyone. I think we'll make a start on time because we've got lots to get through and it's going to be rather fast paced. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, I think um, you all know who I am, Dr. Shireen Kassam. Um, it's been a fabulous year. I spoke last year on cancer and on that day founded an organisation called Plant Based Health Professionals UK. We have a great team around us and it's been a great year. So we've had two large medical conferences. We've had invited speakers from the US, Dr. Kim Williams and Dr. Joel Furman, and we're going strength to strength. And our mission is to provide evidence based education in the field of plant based nutrition and other the lifestyle interventions for the prevention and reversal of chronic disease. So today I'm going to cover some myths that are still prevalent amongst the medical community and hopefully give you some phrases, some information about how to talk to your health professionals, to your friends and families about why you've chosen a plant-based diet. Now we're not really talking about veganism, veganism is not a diet as you well know, but we're talking about a, a diet that's centered around whole plant foods. And this is the reason why leading causes of death in the UK, top cause still remains cardiovascular disease, heart disease and stroke. And it's uh, estimated that up to 80% of cases could be prevented through our sensible lifestyle choices. The second top cause of death is cancer. And again, I'll come to why lifestyle is so important. And what is causing these deaths? These are the leading risk factors. And you look at the top seven of these risk factors, high blood pressure, smoking, high cholesterol, obesity, a diet low in fruits and vegetables, a lack of physical activity and alcohol. They are all related to our lifestyle choices. So when you look at data from around the world, and this is put together by the Global Burden of Disease Study Group, looking at 21 regions of the world, you can see when you look at dietary factors, um, things like a diet low in fruit are causing nearly 5 million deaths a year. A diet high in sodium is causing more than 3 million deaths as is um, a lifestyle low in physical activity. And again, the importance of whole grains, vegetables, nuts and seeds are highlighted. So it's not just about eliminating animal foods, it's about um, emphasizing the whole plant foods in the diet. So what is our current solution? Medical professionals are really armed with very little, um, given the pressures on time and resources. And we, we use pills, essentially, but we know that the third commonest cause of death is our healthcare system, our pills and procedures. Half of adults are on at least one medication, and one in four adults on three medications. Yet, as I say, we come back to the facts that over 70% of our diseases that we're dealing with are preventable through lifestyle choices. So this is the real solution. It's not being vegan, it's being whole food plant-based with a diet centered around fruits, whole grains, legumes, and vegetables, with emphasizing water for drinking, but tea and coffee can be used as well as a healthful drinks. So we have to cover this briefly. I'm sure you all know the answers to this, but I think it's just useful to cover. It's obvious that the largest mammals on this planet eat plants. They're herbivores. We get our protein from plants. And you don't need to worry about mixing and matching. If you're eating a calorie replete diet, you will be getting more than enough protein. And so just the basics are that for a woman, you need around 46 grams of protein a day and a man 56. And this is an overestimation. Most of us don't need this much protein. And I've stolen these examples from Neil Barnard from PCRM. But if all you ate was 2,000 calories of broccoli, you would get three times the amount of protein that you require. The same with lentils. And you can virtually meet your requirements by only eating um, carrots and brown rice. And clearly, we're not going to do this. But it's just obvious that we can get all our protein from plants. So the question is not about quantity, it's about the quality of the protein we are eating. The reason we're tr choosing plant proteins over animal proteins is because the evidence suggests and strongly supports that animal protein is having an adverse effect on our cells, our blood vessels and our tissues. And here is a list of reasons why, and I could do a whole talk just on animal protein. 
But just briefly, when you cook animal protein, there's generation of advanced glycation end products, so AGEs, which damage the cells and the blood vessels. We generate carcinogens, cancer-forming agents, either when we cook the meat or when it enters the bowel and it forms N-nitroso compounds. Heme iron, which I'll come back to, is revered by health professionals, but actually we know that the heme iron it causes oxidative stress, damages our cells and our tissues. Um, animal protein elevates IGF-1 levels, which has been correlated with increased risk of several different cancers. Um, all studies that have looked at this have shown that the more animal protein that's eaten, the, the higher your weight is going to be. You're going to be um, more heavy than somebody who's predominantly eating plant proteins. There's inflammation. There's several reasons why this occurs, but one reason includes the bacterial contamination of animal foods. And even though you kill the bacteria, the endotoxin is still present. It gets into the body and it causes inflammation. The amino acids in the protein of animals is high in sulfur, which gets converted to sulfuric acid and forms an acid environment in the body. And in the bowel, the gut bacteria convert choline and carnitine from animal protein into TMAO. That is a compound that has been directly linked with atherosclerosis, so heart disease. Um, and of course, Animal proteins are devoid of all the benefits of plant protein, that is fiber and the micronutrients. So studies have shown that replacing just 3% of your diet's animal protein with plant protein can decrease your chances of death by 34%. So small differences make big impacts on your health outcome. So are we going to be anemic? The answer is no, and you have to ask yourself why 70% of B12 supplements are given to animals. That's because neither humans nor non-human animals make B12. It's made by the microorganisms in the soil, and none of us are getting a good amount, whether we're omnivores or, or vegans. So it's straightforward. You need a reliable source. You need very little on a daily basis, but the dosage you need to have in supplemental form needs to be higher because our absorption is less efficient. And the efficiency of the absorption goes down as we age. So you may need a higher dose as you get older. It's a simple blood test if you're not sure if you're getting enough um, B12, but a supplement of the doses that are on this slide um, will help you maintain an adequate B12 level. And we know that omnivores also are high risk of B12 deficiency. Iron. So vegans are not more likely than omnivores to be iron deficient. What we will have is lower iron stores, and this is beneficial. Um, high iron stores, especially if they've come from heme iron, that's the iron that's derived from the red blood um, cells and the muscles, has been linked with increased risks of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and cancer because of this oxidative stress that it creates, because it creates um, N-nitroso compounds in the gut. So you will get plenty of iron from um, the diet. Now, the body only get, has one way of eliminating iron, and that's through blood loss. So this is mainly a problem for menstruating females. If you need more iron in the diet, then add a source of vitamin C at mealtimes to increase the absorption. Avoid tea and coffee at mealtimes because the polyphenols decrease the absorption of iron. And that's the same for calcium supplements. Um, and then increase um, your legume intake, which is a good source of iron. And if you're still not um, getting enough, enough iron, then, um, then you may need a supplement if you're having heavy periods. And that supplement as a tablet form is, is better um, as it's non-heme iron compared to... Go, compared to substituting it for animal protein and iron. So thirdly, 
Um, a myth that, again, is prevalent amongst health professionals, and this isn't really related to plant-based or animal-based um, diets per se, but what we tell our patients is your blood pressure increases with age. And this really is not true. We're not physiologically programmed to have a rising blood pressure as we get older. We know that Western society's high blood pressure is the leading cause of death and disability, but is intimately related to our lifestyle choices. And this chart from the 19... Um, 20s shows on the left hand side the blood pressures of native Kenyans when they get older their blood pressure goes down but when Europeans and Americans get older their blood pressure goes up and of course you could say that um, this is related to genetic factors but we know when people emigrate to America and European countries they take on that same risk of disease of the new country and it was in 1940 when Walter Kempner um, treated patients with malignant hypertension at Duke University. This is a condition where the blood pressure is so high that it's damaging your, your brain, your blood vessels, your eyes and your kidneys. And there was no treatment in the 1940s. It was before the advent of blood pressure tablets. He put people on what is now termed the rice diet. So he used white rice, he used white sugar, fruit juice and whole fruit. It was a calorie replete diet. He eliminated animal proteins, animal fats and all salt and people's blood pressure came down within days to weeks. And this rice diet is still being used in, in different formulations to treat lifestyle diseases. But what I'm trying to say is that blood pressure, high blood pressure can be reversed through um, a dietary approach. So it really can't be a normal physiological response to have high blood pressure as we get older. And the whole body of evidence shows that vegetarian diets are associated with a lower blood pressure, such that public health initiatives really should be using this approach to create uh, lower blood pressures within the population. Now, salt really is implicated in the pathogenesis of high blood pressure. There's no getting away from it. So processed food, which is apparently making up more than 50% of our shopping baskets in the UK, is really high in added salt. And on the left-hand side, oops, sorry, you can see that as the dietary salt increases, as um, shown by the excretion of sodium in the urine, your blood pressure goes up. But of course, the reverse is true. As you get rid of salt in your diet, your blood pressure goes down. And the effect is much more pronounced if you're already starting um, with hypertension. So this is um, what we've put together from plant-based health professionals created by Doug Brister, our IT whiz. And it just tells you the evidence base for keeping a normal low blood pressure. Keep a healthy weight. Eat plants because they're rich in potassium, which keeps your blood pressure low. Sleep well and relax more. Exercise regularly. Avoid processed food, partly because of the high salt and partly its association with increasing weight. Limit salt and limit alcohol and avoid tobacco. So in randomized studies, there's certain foods, plant foods, that have been shown to have the same effect on blood pressure as blood pressure lowering medication. Two tablespoons of flax seeds a day um, should be incorporated into anyone's diet for a number of reasons, but including the blood pressure lowering effects. Three cups, of tea of, uh, three cups of hibiscus tea has been shown to lower blood pressure the same as um, medication. Nitrite-rich vegetables get converted into nitric oxide, which dilates the blood vessels, and this again lowers blood pressure. And this is why randomized studies of beetroot juice, 250 mils a day, have also been shown to reduce blood pressure because it's high in nitrate. So I could spend another whole talk talking about animal fat, butter, cholesterol, saturated fat, but I'll try and cover the basics. So we're confused. Time magazine in 1984 warned us that saturated fat and cholesterol in the diet elevates our blood cholesterol, and this is the cause of heart disease. This truth has not changed. What has changed is the media messaging, and there's a number of ulterior motives behind this. 
So in 2014, Time magazine told us to eat butter and it didn't impact our risk of heart disease. And the reason for this mixed messaging is that in 2014 and then later in 2015, two large studies failed to show an association between the intake of dietary saturated fat and cholesterol and blood cholesterol. The reasons why are the way the analysis was done. So firstly, one of the large studies excluded people who already had a high blood cholesterol. So you got rid of your worst of worst. So what you're left with is a more homogenous group of people. Secondly, the studies didn't tell us what the low saturated fat group were, were eating instead. So if you replace saturated fat with sugar, processed food, etc you're not going to impact your risk of heart disease because sugar is also implicated in the pathogenesis of heart disease. And thirdly, um, the differences between the groups that were analysed were just not um, extreme enough. If you look at populations with moderate intake of saturated fat and then compare it to populations who are eating just a little bit more of saturated fat, you're just not going to see um, a difference. So this remains true, this graph from the 1980s. The more, um, the higher your cholesterol in the blood, the higher your risk of dying of heart disease. And the studies have shown that if you can get your cholesterol level down to below four in the UK units of measurement, that you're virtually heart attack proof. And when you look at different diet patterns, it's clear that what we're eating is intimately, uh, intimately related to our blood cholesterol levels. So meat eaters have the highest blood cholesterol, second to that of the fish eaters. Um, the second lowest is the vegetarians, but the vegans have the lowest blood cholesterol of all diet patterns. And this is just one example of a study. Several have shown the same. And we're not terribly interested in blood measurements. We're interested in hard endpoints like heart disease and death. And studies have shown that vegetarians have a significantly lower chance of dying of heart disease, 29% lower than non-vegetarians. And so the foods we eat really impact our blood cholesterol level. And you can see here in red that regardless of whether you choose um, lean meats, meats without skin, fish, eggs, dairy, they are all very high in cholesterol, cholesterol that's unnecessary in the diet. And they are also equally high in saturated fat, which directly increases your blood cholesterol level. Whereas in green, all the plant foods are devoid of cholesterol and have very little saturated fat. So some basic formulas, again, created in the 1980s, still true today, a 1% increase in your intake of saturated fat increases your bad LDL cholesterol by 2%, and a 1% decrease in your blood cholesterol decreases your risk of heart disease by 2%. So just small differences can make a big impact on your incidence of heart disease and death. And there is continued confusion over the healthful plant fats. So nuts and seeds in all studies have been shown to decrease the risk of heart disease and the risk of death by up to 30%. And the fats in avocado are also useful at reducing blood cholesterol, partly because it's replacing the animal-derived fats, but also it's been shown to reduce the really harmful LDL cholesterol, which is the small, dense LDL cholesterol. And olive oil. So... It's still much confusion about whether we need oil in our cooking, in our food. My view is that we really don't need added oil. And the Mediterranean is, diet is healthful despite the addition of olive oil, not because of it. The Mediterranean diet is high in whole plant foods, and therefore if you're having a bit of olive oil, you're probably not doing too much harm, but it's the plant foods that are healthy. But you have to think that processed oil has twice the calorie density of sugar, carbohydrates, and protein, and fat goes to fat. There's nothing else that happens to that in the body. Um, there's very little nutrients in terms of vitamins and minerals. 
When you look at people who've just consumed some olive oil and look at the functioning of the heart arteries, they are impaired, they're damaged directly and instantly by the addition of um, free oils to the diet. So I would avoid, although I think small amounts alongside lots of healthy fruits and vegetables probably won't do too much harm. And this man showed us definitively, Dr. Dean Ornish from America, that if you, you change your diet after a diagnosis of heart disease to one centered around whole plant foods, low in fat, low in salt, and you do regular exercise and stress relieving activities, that you can reverse heart disease. So he did a randomized study that was published in a high impact journal, The Lancet, in 1990s, and demonstrated reversal of heart disease through a lifestyle approach only. So moving on, um, cancer. We seem to believe that cancer is genetic, it's our fate, and there's nothing we can do about this. This couldn't be further from the truth. Less than 10% of cases of cancer are caused by the genes that we inherit from our mother and father. So that means that we have the chance to impact 90% of cases. And at best estimates um, suggest that more than four in 10 cancer cases in the UK could be prevented um, by stopping smoking, eating more fruits and vegetables, being a healthful weight, avoiding alcohol, limiting sun exposure, and having regular exercise. And we've known for over a, de over a century, sorry, that um, cancer is directly linked to our diet choices. So on the left here in Scientific America, 1892, cancer is most frequent among those branches of the human race where carnivorous habits prevail. And here in the New York Times, 1907, cancer increasing in meat eaters. Vegetarians um, show the lowest mortality of all. Oh, sorry. Um, and so the World Cancer Research Fund published in May 2018 their recommendations for cancer prevention. And there are nine main recommendations. And they also suggest that 40% of cancers worldwide could be prevented if we follow these recommendations. Be a healthful weight. Obesity is second only to tobacco as the commonest cause of cancer. Be physically active. And here we go again. Eat a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans. It doesn't say you need a bit of dairy, you need a bit of chicken, you need a bit of fish. It says concentrate on whole plant foods. Limit fast foods, partly because of the salt, fat, and sugar in there, but um, also because there's a direct correlation with the amount of processed food you're eating and your risk of cancer. Limit red and processed meat. I would say avoid. The WHO in 2015 classed processed meats as a group one carcinogen. It causes cancer. And red meat as a probable can a carcinogen. With, there is no need for us to eat this. Limit consumption of sugar, mainly because of its association with increasing weight. Limit alcohol. Unfortunately, there is no safe limit for alcohol consumption if your primary um, objective is to prevent cancer. Do not use supplements. There's no evidence that supports um, cancer prevention. And for mothers, breastfeed, because this has benefits for the baby in the long term and also for the mother for preventing breast cancer. And there's now evidence to support that after a diagnosis of cancer, particularly commonest ones such as prostate cancer, breast cancer and colon cancer, that if you follow these recommendations, that you increase your chance of being in remission and you increase your chance of survival. And again, we come back to the same study that showed that vegetarians have an 18% reduced incidence of cancer. And again, as I say, you know, many health professionals tell you, well, there's nothing you can do, eat in moderation, you know, eat what you enjoy after a, 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 a diagnosis of cancer. But this couldn't be further from the truth. Um, Dean Ornish again, um, a, a really seminal paper here, Early stage prostate cancer, he put half the group on a whole, a whole food plant-based diet, low in fat, low in added oil, and um, an exercise program with meditation. And he compared to a group that didn't change their lifestyle. And after one year, in the lifestyle group in red, the prostate-specific antigen level had gone down significantly, such that the pro prostate cancer 
growth was limited, whereas the opposite was true in the control group. There was a continual rise in the prostate-specific antigen level. And at two years follow-up, 27% of the control group needed conventional cancer treatment, which was radiation or surgery, whereas only 5% of the lifestyle group needed intervention. So, moving on to soya. Is it bad? The answer is no. The data is quite clear that soya forms part of a healthful diet, whether you're om an om omnivore or a vegetarian or a vegan, soya supports health. And it's one of the only foods that the FDA have actually allowed a health claim, and their health claim states that it lowers blood cholesterol, which it does, and therefore reduces the, the um, risk of heart disease. So what is the issue with soya? It's the isoflavones, which are plant estrogens, but they act very differently from human estrogens. They are a selective estrogen receptor modulator. So in some tissues, they are anti-estrogen, and in some tissues, they are pro-estrogenic. But none of these effects have been shown to have an adverse effect. In fact, quite the opposite. As I say, there's a health claim that the FDA has approved showing that soya consumption reduces cholesterol. It's quite clear that soya consumption reduces your incidence of breast cancer, especially if you consume it in adolescence, the rate of breast cancer later in life is um, less. And after a diagnosis of breast cancer, it can help reduce recurrence. It reduces prostate cancer, and Dean Ornish used soya products in his um, prostate cancer reversal study and it reduces menopausal symptoms because of its pro-estrogenic effects. And of course, it's a good source of calcium and iron. So I won't go into this in too much detail because Gemma Newman's going to be talking on diabetes um, for a whole 45 minutes at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Um, but this is a myth that is propagated. Diabetes is caused by sugar and carbohydrates. This is not true. Diabetes is caused by our intake of animal protein and animal fat. And again, I'll come back to Walter Kempner. He was the one that put people on this rice diet. Rice, white sugar, fruit juice, and whole um, fruit. Um, and he was able to reverse diabetes without limiting calories in those who presented to his hospital. So you can reverse diabetes by eating white rice, white sugar, and fruit juice. And this is the reason why. So in a normal person, when you eat sugar, when you eat carbohydrates, the glucose in the blood needs to go into the cell and insulin needs to open the receptors that allows that to happen. But when your diet is rich in animal protein and animal fat, the fat and the inflammation that's created by the animal protein results in the accumulation of fat in the muscle cells and the liver cells. This is called intramyocellular lipid. And this fat sits there and it prevents the action of insulin on the insulin receptors so that the glucose level in the blood stays high. So you can see why just by eliminating sugar, all you're doing is getting rid of this bit. So it's a temporary fix what you're not getting rid of is the intramyocellular lipid, the fat in the cells that has been created and put there by our, um, our diets rich in animal fat and protein. And studies have clearly shown that our diet patterns predict our risk of getting diabetes. So vegans have 50% less chance of de developing di diabetes than on an omnivorous diet. And it's still lower than those that are semi-vegetarian, only eating meats occasionally, those only eating fish and lacto-ovo-vegetarians. Uh, and not only does it reduce the risk of diabetes, studies have shown that you can reduce or greatly improve your diabetes control by changing your diet after a diagnosis to one centered around whole plant foods, low in oil, low in salt. So briefly, is dairy necessary for bone health? What is necessary for bone health is calcium, and dairy contains calcium. But that's where the correlation ends, because there are no data to support the role of dairy in bone health. In fact, the opposite. There is not a single study that shows that consumption of dairy in children improves bone health later in life. There is no study that shows that consumption of dairy prevents fractures in adults. In fact, Several studies have shown that high intake of particularly milk 
increases your risk of, of fractures. And what is also increasing the risk is a diet high in animal protein. For the reason I've um, explained already, that animal proteins high in sulfur create sulfuric acid, and that needs to be buffered in the blood by calcium. So the more animal protein and calcium that you eat, the more that you lose in the urine. So overall, you don't impact your calcium um, intake. But what dairy consumption has been conclusively linked with is an increased risk of prostate cancer in men. And high intakes increase your risk by about 30%. And it's the high levels of um, growth hormone, estrogen, and insulin-like growth factor that increases this risk of prostate cancer. There have been studies that have also shown an increased risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. There was a large study from Sweden that looked at individuals with lactose intolerance, so people who would avoid dairy consumption, and they compared them to their family members who were eating and consuming dairy products. And this was thousands of people, and they showed that those who were avoiding um, anim uh, animal, uh, sorry, avoiding dairy, so avoiding lactose because they were lactose intolerant, had a much lower incidence of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and lung cancer. It's clear that dairy consumption in the first six months of life increases your risk of type 1 diabetes. And of course, because of its high fat nature, it's an ex it exposes us to environmental pesticides and um, pollutants, organic pollutants that persist in animal fat. So we can get up a calcium from plants because you have to remember that calcium is a mineral found in the soil. It's not made by humans or non-human animals. It's obtained from the soil, which goes into the plants, and then we can eat the plants. Um, so concentrate on the dark leafy greens, also um, the tofu I've mentioned already, and beans. Um, and the, our bone health is positively impacted by eating um, vegetables that are high in vitamin K, potassium and magnesium, which you're not going to be getting from animal sources. So these are the factors that have been linked with better bone health and preventing osteoporosis in studies. Eat fruits and vegetables, reduce sodium intake, ensure that you're getting enough calcium from plants and adequate vitamin D from the sun. In the winter months, we all probably need a supplement, um, and that is recommended by NICE. Um, limit animal protein because that is correlated with increased bone fractures. Maintain a healthful weight, regular exercise that's weight-bearing, avoid smoking and limit alcohol, and caffeine consumption has been linked with poorer um, bone health as well, but probably drinking three to four cups of coffee is okay, more than that may impact your bone health. So just briefly to cover the whole issue of whether organic meat is better for health compared to non-organic meat. And up until two days ago, I was going to say that there was no long-term studies showing any benefit to organic food consumption. But actually, a large study from uh, France has just been published in the Journal of American Medical Association showing that actually those that consume more organic foods have a lower incidence of cancer. So that was organic meat, organic fruits and vegetables. However, again, it's, it's a correlation. It doesn't prove causation. Um, so I think the jury's out. And I think ideally, we should all be trying to select organic fruits and vegetables if we can. However, if it means that you um, are going to reduce your intake of fruit and vegetables because you can't afford or can't access organic food, it's clear that it's better to be eating lots more fruits and vegetables and not worrying about the pesticide re residues. But when it comes to organic meat, yes, there are less pesticide residues in organic meat. There's also more omega-3 fats because the animals have been allowed to eat their natural foods like the grass, and there's less antibiotic-resistant bacteria in organic meat. However, all the issues with animal protein persist. The increased levels of advanced glycation end products, the problem with heme iron, the increasing levels of IGF-1, that will not change um, based on the organic or non-organic nature of it. And studies have also shown that persistent organic pollutants like PCBs, dioxins, that accumulate in animal fat 
and um, where 90% of our exposure to POP, so persistent organic pollutants, come from eating animal products, is not going to be any different between organic or non-organic meat. And the organic meat is still contaminated with bacteria to the same degree, it's just that those bacteria are less likely to be antibiotic resistant. So when you get your food transmitted infection, you're more likely to be able to have an antibiotic that works. So I think this is my final myth. Um, many doctors in the UK, sadly, are propagating um, a, a diet and a diet fad known as either paleo or low carb. They're sort of interchangeable terms where you're emphasizing animal products and animal fats um, over certain, um, certain carbohydrates. So paleo diet emphasizes meat low carbs um, get rid of quite a lot of starchy vegetables and whole grains and for example the paleo diet avoids grains and legumes which are two food groups that have been associated with longevity and low um, risk of heart disease cancer diabetes hypertension um, but it's not the carbs that are causing the problem. Carbohydrates do not make us fat. It's very difficult to get fat when you're just eating carbohydrates because carbohydrates are converted to glycogen and you can store loads of glycogen. Very difficult to make too much fat. What is converted to fat is excess protein. And the, um, the issue of calories in, calories out is correct. So you need to be consuming calories that's correct for the amount that you're expending. And fat has double the amount of calories of carbohydrates and protein. So you can't get away from the fact that if you're emphasizing animal fat and animal protein, you're going to be consuming calorie dense foods. So carbohydrate low diets, low carb diets, essentially tells you to avoid grains, so that it includes whole grains, Sugars, fine, I don't want you to be eating free sugars, but starchy vegetables and also sometimes avoids fruits. And I've just told you that um, the biggest dietary cause of death is a diet low in fruit. So to avoid it makes no sense at all. It focuses on high protein foods, which are often animal based foods. Um, it does allow some low carb vegetables, but then the amount of carbohydrates vary depending on what papers you read. And there are some immediate benefits. So a low carb diet, you will lose weight. But the reason being is that you're losing the glycogen stores from your muscle because you're using that as your energy source. And with glycogen is stored water. So you lose water. So immediately you're going to lose two kilograms of water. It improves blood sugar control for the reasons I've told you, because you're not generating the sugar from the carbohydrates, but it doesn't do anything to improve insulin resistance. And people report improved satiety. And because of some of the immediate side effects of feeling nauseous and fatigued, the appetite goes down, and so people generally eat less calories. So those are the reasons for the immediate benefits of this type of diet. But there are short-term risks. You have nutrient deficiencies for not eating enough fruits and vegetables. You get constipated because you're not eating enough fiber. The immediate side effects that are known as keto flu, the nausea, fatigue, headaches, muscle aches, are pretty much immediate and don't feel very nice. And you're not reducing insulin resistance. 30% of people have a rise in their LDL cholesterol. And I've told you that LDL cholesterol is the biggest cause and predictor of heart disease. When you eat a high fat meal, immediately the artery function is impaired. Studies have shown impairment in athletic function as well because athletes need sugar. They need carbohydrates converted to sugar to make ATP for their muscles. And you get bad breath, which I guess is neither here or there. So the long term risks are the biggest concern. Study after study after study are showing that if you have a diet that's low in carbohydrate and replace that with animal foods, you increase the risk of death, you increase your risk of cardiovascular disease, you increase your risk of cancers related to low fiber intake, predominantly colon cancer. And of course, I've told you that the exposure to pollutants is much higher in animal-based foods. Now, there are some interesting studies coming out on what is known as eco-Atkins, mainly out of Toronto by Dr. David Jenkins. And he's using a low-carbohydrate plant-based diet. And there may be some value in that, but I think there's no long-term data on that. And I think we have to watch this space. 
So I think when we talk about our diet choices and one centre around whole plant foods, we have to talk about why we're choosing this diet pattern. And it's because it's nutrient rich and low in calories. It's full of the nutrients that most of us are deficient in. And one of the biggest problems of our Western diet is our fibre deficiency. But also plant-based diets are rich in vitamin A, C, E and K, magnesium, potassium, beta carotene, folate. So when we're talking about these diets, we have to know what we're um, substituting these animal products for. And it's just worth spending a little bit of time on fiber. We have known for decades that fiber um, deficient diets is the cause of certain cancers, but also increases the risk of heart disease and diabetes and high blood pressure. And Dennis Burkett was a remarkable gentleman. He was an Irish surgeon who spent a lot of time in Africa doing missionary work. And he made these seminal observations. He noted that the Africans who were eating very little processed food um, but was high in unrefined whole plant foods, virtually never got bowel cancer. They also virtually never got diverticular disease or appendicitis. But he's, he's found that those that were eating highly processed diet um, and were replacing plant foods with animal foods had an increasing risk of all these bowel disorders, particularly colon cancer. And the World Health Organization have also published studies showing that fiber intake reduces the risk of colon cancer. If we doubled our intake of fiber from 20 grams a day to 40 grams a day, we would halve our risk of bowel cancer. And most of us are not even achieving 15 grams of fiber a day. And so the diets that are associated with longevity are one centered around whole plant foods. And some of the longest lived populations around the world in regions known as the blue zones, so Okinawa in Japan, here is a centenarian from Okinawa, are eating a diet that's centered around plant foods. They eat animal products and animal foods about five times a month. They also do regular exercise and have strong communities and, and many other factors. But when it comes to diet, it's one that's centered around whole plant foods. So this brings my talk to an end. And I think if you want to explore how to incorporate more plant foods into your diet and how to utilize them and how to cook without oil. Um, this is a patient who reached out to me and then spoke at our first conference on plant-based nutrition. She reversed her inflammatory arthritis through a whole food plant-based diet and she has written this amazing cookbook um, that really has a number of great recipes that are whole food plant-based and no oil. So a small plug there, but with no financial or industry influence at all, it's just somebody who wants to pass on the messages she's learned about reversing her inflammatory arthritis. There are a number of other wonderful books and documentaries that you all know about, but I do urge you to read them. And I'll just leave you with these two quotes from um, Dennis Burkett, who really was a vis visionary um, surgeon. Thank you very much.